Right, hello everybody. I have some wonderful news for you. But before I tell you what the wonderful news is, we are going to re-enact what just happened. Viam and I got off this car to go looking for Hosanna and we couldn't find him. We got very sweaty while we did it. And then we were driving along and Viam says to me, Viam, what did you say? Yes, if you were Hosanna, you'd be lying on your back in the shade. And I said, with an ice-cold lager, a bitterly cold ice-cold lager. And Viam said, yes, that would be nice. And then, as we were arriving about this point, I was looking right. Viam, what did you say? Oh, yes, there he is underneath that tree. <laughs> and that is what Viam saw. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I'm just going to call it in quickly. And I'm not sure that that, I mean, are we sure that is Hosanna? Not sure. I don't know who that is. It's a leopard. There are Tundi's, Tundi's tracks are in this area. Anyway, let's go and have a look. Stations located leopard on Ledwood Road at the bend where it turns towards the south. I'm not sure who it is just yet. We'll keep you updated. She's just off the road. Now, of course, I didn't see anything here. VM said, there he is. Just, let's just see. I'm not convinced this is a young male. It might be. I'm not going to get too close. Okay, let's have a look-see. It looks like Tundi's angry face to me. And a yeah, mangled bottom left canine. I think this is the dear mother. Does she have a mangled bottom left canine? I seem to remember she does. She's a 3-3 female, if I, don't, if I remember correctly. And that's what this is. How cool is that, everyone? Station, this looks like Tundi here on Deadwood Road. Ah, what a joy. Well done, Viam. You've made our afternoon. She does look a little bit angry. Well, I think if you had cubs, you'd also be a little bit angry. Now, no doubt, many of you are saying wow to this, and it is very wow indeed. Uh, she's growling at us. She's just giving us a little lift of her teeth every so often. So I'm going to reverse slightly, just increase the space. That's exactly what I picked up as we just turned off the road. We're just going to go onto the road, so she's got a bit more space between us and her. She will, I think, almost exactly like any human mother who has just given birth or is in the process of looking after young children, I suspect you'll find that she's just a little bit tired, fraught and irritated generally with life. So we'll just stop there. You've got a decent view there, Vim. Yeah. Now, Phil, you're wondering if she's still got little cubs. We think she does. We're hoping desperately that we're going to confirm how many there are and who they are and where they live very soon. Now, I'm hearing on the radio that there were two female leopards found on Juma this morning. But I'm really struggling to believe that. 
I think mine was probably Hosanna. Yes, in fact, that's exactly what's going on. The incompetence going into my right ear right now is going to make my brain explode. I may just turn it off completely. There we go. I've done it now. No, she wouldn't, Stacey. You say, would she have the babies out this early? No. So I got back here. When did I get back here? About, ooh, must be two weeks ago now, I guess. And she, we think she'd just given birth. Tristan had eyed out a potential den spot. He hadn't seen her go into it, but he thought that's where she was. And so I think these cubs are probably between two and three weeks old. Now that means that there's no ways they'll be out of the den just yet. And it means that we're probably going to wait another three weeks before we start to view them. That said, we are certainly going to try and find out how many there are and where they are. Now the interesting thing, of course, is that Hosanna was absolutely in this area as well. And if you were watching yesterday afternoon's drive, you'll know, of course, that he pitched up to say hello to Tingana, an astonishing spectacle of watching him fearlessly walking up to his father, his father spitting, hissing and making noise at him, and he just lay down next to him as if to say, come on, Dad, can't we just be friends? And wouldn't it just be something if he came to visit... What is she? She's not his aunt, she's his cousin. In fact, she's not, she's a sister, yes, exactly. That's absolutely correct. Now, Monique, you say, do I think she's moved the den? Monique, we do think she's moved the den. We're not sure to where, though. It won't be around here. I think we're a long way from where she originally gave birth. We think she may well have moved the den away from the original termite mound, possibly down into the drainage line that is just between the junction of uh, Nyala Road South and Central Road. And I think, you, you know what, if you don't, obviously to many of you, you won't know what that means, what I'm talking about. But, uh, you know what, somebody came in here this morning. This is interesting. Somebody came into this area this morning. I can see a vehicle track. I wonder if that's why she isn't looking a little bit irritated. Anyway, if you want to see where those roads are, if you go to the Google Earth, I actually think quite a few of them are marked on Google Earth, so you can probably find where we are, or the area that I'm talking about, where we think her second den is. We are just going to give her some space. She can be a little bit ornery, this leopardess. And ornery she most certainly is going to be if she's got three or two little cubs and we're putting pressure on her. I just have a feeling it's three. I've got absolutely no idea. I also don't know where Tumba is. I haven't seen him for a long or so since I've got back. And I don't know when he was last seen. Do you know him? No. I also didn't realise that she'd lost that... Well, she hasn't lost her bottom left canine, but she certainly got it cracked. So it's not as sharp as it once was. She's 11 now, of course. Good age for a leopardess. And whenever I talk about teeth, of course, I think of my own missing premolar on the left. Mm. It's pretty hot out here today. It's about 37 degrees Celsius or so, 90 degree, 99 degrees Fahrenheit. Maybe a bit of a storm brewing in the far west. I don't think it'll hit us today. But otherwise, the only other sounds I can hear are... Flies. Zzz, zzz. Franklin in the distance. Just little odd squeaks and squawks and tweets from the birds. And then 
a little bit of wind noise rustling through the early summer greenery. Ellie, you're wondering about the how altricial leopard cubs are when they're born. In other words, are they born with their eyes closed like domestic cats? They are. They are born with their eyes closed, utterly helpless, almost completely immobile. And that's why the most vulnerable time of their lives is probably between now and the time that they start to climb trees, which will be at around six weeks. They will attempt to scrabble up trees because then they can get away from hyenas, of course. Interesting why she was just uncomfortable with us being as close as we are. I often think it's our voices, you know. Sometimes if you just sit, they don't react, and then sometimes you'll start talking. Certainly Karula used to do that sometimes. She revved a few vehicles quite badly. And it was normally when there were guests or guides talking loudly. Kathy, you say what are the chances that she would abandon her cubs? At this stage, I'd say fairly poor. I don't think she'd do that. There's no reason for it. There's no drought on where she's given birth the perfect time. There are plenty of impala lambs around for her to eat. That's easy pickings for a leopardess like this. So there's no reason that she'd abandon her cubs. She doesn't have a record of abandoning her cubs. So no, I don't think she'll, I don't think she'll abandon them. I suppose in times of, of great drought and times of, you know, enormous difficulty of there's nothing to eat and her milk reserves were so poor or that the, you know, the cubs were taking so much out of her that she was going to struggle to survive, well, then she might abandon them. It's interesting in animals like this, you know, the advantage of abandoning cubs in order to mate again and have more when times are more favorable is or the advantages of, of abandoning them versus trying to sort of eke out a living rather than waiting for better times are hugely greater than the advantages of waiting for better times. So it's not impossible that a leopardess in tough times will abandon their cubs and there are lots of animals in the mammal kingdom or in the mammal class that will do that. And as for human beings, it's very difficult for us to accept that, of course, because we co it's unthinkable to us. But that's also because we live in communities and therefore the responsibility of feeding youngsters doesn't fall only to the mother. Popfer, you must be a new viewer. You say, is this leopardess wild or captive? Popfer, this leopardess is as wild as a leopard can be. If I got anywhere near her on foot, she would do one of two things. She would either run away, she would almost certainly growl at me, but if her cubs were anywhere nearby, she would come at me and quite possibly tear me to pieces, which of course wouldn't be very pleasant at all. She's totally wild. The only reason she's letting us sit this close to her is that she was born around and near vehicles. And so she doesn't associate us with a threat. But you saw, we got to within about 15 meters or so, 45 feet of her, 50 feet, and she was very dissatisfied. She snarled at us and she gave us a little bit of a growl. And so we increased that distance to about, ooh, we're probably 40 meters away now, which is just over, you know, goodness, my math is sitting me down, so 180 to, up to almost 200 feet. And now she's fine. So she's not captive in the slightest and she most certainly is not tame. That is a completely wild animal there. As are all the animals here, we're sitting in an area that is eight and a half million acres in extent. We don't traverse all of that, but it is part of the greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. And so between us and Mozambique, 
Zimbabwe in the north and Swaziland in the south, there are no fences and all of the animals living here are completely wild. And she's just turned around, which is very unkind of her. Ooh, a little lizard. Wasim, you say am I at a safe distance? Yes, at this distance I am at a safe distance. She seems to be particularly pleased with us here. She's turned around, she's relaxed. She's not looking at us anymore, worrying about where we are. So yeah, I think we're fine over here. I'm going to have to reassess that situation now because we obviously can't see her properly. So I'm going to move around a bit and see if we can't get another view. This is going to be the best kind of distance we want to stay from her. If she got really upset, she'd get up and she'd charge us maybe, and she'd probably stop with about three meters away. And even though I wouldn't feel like there was an enormous danger, I tell you what, when that happens, there are two feelings I have. One, of course, is a fear for my life and Viam's. And the other is that I've done something wrong. I have irritated an animal to the extent that she has chosen to engage me and say, go away. And that would make me feel very dreadful. So what we're going to try and do is just move around the side and see if we can't get a slightly better view of her. And what we don't want to do is put her under any pressure at all. Atomic X, you ask a question, would a leopard adopt an abandoned lion cub? No, absolutely not. She might eat it. She would almost certainly not adopt it. Can you see it there, Vian? Back of it? Say when. Yeah? That's not a great shot. We will try and go in a little bit closer now that she's relaxed, but you can see she keeps looking at us. She's not going to sleep. So I'm just going to give her a bit of space. I wonder if she didn't have a bad experience this morning. So no, leopards will not adopt lion cubs. Has it ever happened before? Oof. You know, you see these stories of things like that happening out here. It would be very interesting, you know, it's, uh, although when I first heard the question I thought that's ridiculous, there's no ways it would ever happen. It would be fascinating to know what would happen if a lactating female leopard uh, who lost her cubs was suddenly given a lion cub of the same age as her lost cubs and whether or not I imagine in a captive environment whether or not she would be prepared to suckle them. I suspect not. Was there? Yeah. Oh, here we go. So we've got information coming in from behind me here that there was a lioness in the Serengeti who adopted a leopard cub. <laughs> and what happened? We must, he doesn't know what happened. We must googly that. All right, well, while we're thinking about these strange things, let's head across to Tristan. I'm not sure what he's on the search for, but I've no doubt he'll tell you himself. Yes, I cal calculated uh, very little of what we achieved today. It was largely down to VM in his directions and then his eyes. But I'll take it. Now, we've got some Impala that are approaching Tundee. I don't think they're stalking her. I don't think they know she's here. Likewise, I don't think she knows they are there. They are, well, she is just under the tree. We've come round the other side of it. And we've come round the other side because she just lay down behind it. But you can see she's still got that slightly sort of angry cat look about her at the moment. Panting away in the heat. There is a rattling sesticola not too far away going choo choo choo, tuck -a -tuck -a -tuck. choo choo tuck -a -tuck -a -tuck. And I do wonder to myself if perhaps those impala are not thinking, ooh, uh, is 
is there something around? Because they definitely do respond to the alarm calls of the animal, of the birds, not the animal, animal and the other mammals, of course. Anyway, that's what's going on here. Now, I think it's going to be worth sitting here just simply because simply because I think she might get up and go towards the den site at some stage. Linda, she lies down there. You say, would she take on a young buffalo in order to feed her cubs? Uh, Linda, no, I think it's highly unlikely that she'd take one on to feed her cubs. She may well take one on because she felt like eating one. A young, a fe big female leopard will take a very small buffalo calf, absolutely. Remember, those cubs, though, are going to be drinking milk for at least sort of three to six months. Well, certainly more than three months, possibly up to six months. And they will start on their solids from about six weeks. But remember that she will have to take them to a kill, and that she will not take a kill to them. And there would be no reason for her to take on something like a buffalo calf unless she found it isolated from the herd, because, of course, taking on a buffalo in a herd is dangerous on account of the other buffalo in the herd. And so, you know, given how many baby impala there are around the place, well, I think that the chances of her trying to take on a buffalo calf are extremely small. She's smelling things every time the wind blows towards her, and it's not us she's looking at. Maybe she's picked up the smell of fresh impala. Karen, a good question that has no real answer, unfortunately, which is, of course, often the best kind of question. You say, how many leopard cubs in a litter? Well, Karen, two or three is usual. But there can be far, there can be one, there can be four. And I'm not sure what the, the, the record is. I suspect it's probably in captivity around six. But it would be impossible for a leopardess to raise six leopards uh, you know, on her own. Highly, highly unlikely. So I think you'd find that, I, in fact, I've never seen one raise three. I've seen them give birth to three. And I've seen them look after three for a while, but almost inevitably one of them or two of them dies. So I don't think, yeah, I think it's highly unlikely that it would be more than three. I'm just trying to see if I can't find a particularly definitive message on that. Yeah, this is two to four cubs, but I mean, we knew that. Let's go with a world record once off of six, say, or five or six, be highly unlikely, and the normal one being two to three. You say 1.7. You say 1.7, do you, VM? Well, as you are the leopard spotter, we will give you 1.7 for the day. We have no idea, like I say, how many she's given birth to yet. Tumba was her last one. He's now seven months old, and he was single. He was on his own. She's just growling a little bit there. Just watch her carefully. I'm going to speak a little bit more quietly. I mean, we're, so, we're at least 200 feet from her. I mean, if she was, oh, she's not, she's, she's got hiccups. Or a hairball. She's not growling at us. Joe, you're wondering if leopards will hunt during the night. You will read in textbooks that leopards are largely nocturnal. In other words, that they will hunt almost exclusively at night. I have found the opposite 
Well, not the opposite, but I found that they will basically hunt whenever they can, whenever they want to. So yes, they will hunt at night, but they will almost certainly hunt during the day. And I've so often seen leopards moving in the very hottest part of the day. They're marking their territories going from one point to the other, or hunting, much more so than lions do. She keeps looking up to the top of that tree. It'd be so nice to watch her go up there. So yes, they will hunt at night or day. You see her ears pinned back on the top of her head there. Of course she's listening behind her. It's because she's uncomfortable. And I think that discomfort is again evidenced by her movements. She's constantly getting up and lying down, getting up and lying down. And I think it's the heat. And I also think she's eaten something fairly large. Isn't she lovely? Look at the way the light's catching her. A little bit of a clean. Always important if you're a cat to have a bit of a clean. It always amazes me that the power that they have in their back legs like that and the sharpness of their claws doesn't lacerate the skin around their ears and necks when they scratch like that because you can actually hear the skin going. <laughs> She obviously knows exactly how hard to push and how hard not to. Okay, let's see where she goes. Let's also try and see how big her tummy is, how fat she is. Oh, dear. I don't know about any of you, but you know, when somebody says to me, oh, she looks like Tumba, or Tumba looks like her, or Tumba looks like Tingana, I just can't see it. And somebody said yesterday, when Hosanna and Tingana were sitting next to each other, with somebody in the final control as I was watching it, I said, yeah, well, look at them, they look the same. And I just cannot see it. And I think that that is, and I, I wouldn't believe those people if I didn't know for example, that some people are able to identify a leopard on sight. They'll see an ear and say, oh, well, that's, uh, you know, in the same way that as they'll identify their best friend in a crowd. They'll say, well, that's Mvula, that's Tandi, that's Hosanna. But I don't have the mechanism in me to do it. And I wonder, you know, I'm very bad at recognizing people. Oh, there's the kill. Haha, <laughs> right there baby impala. No wonder there's an impala you around here. I'm very sure that this lonely you standing around here is the mother. She's gone there. I don't see her anymore, Viam. Do you? Yeah, I'm sure that's the mother. And Viam was just saying to me how he hates to see this kind of thing. He hates to see the youngsters killed like this. And I know what he means. Look at her. I've just got a radio call to deal with. Just... I'm just going to talk to Rex on quickly. Rex, you just keep coming, I can hear you. Um, she's not very relaxed, so just keep your distance when you get here. Shall we back up a bit? What I meant by that, of course, was I'm going to back up a bit. I should have given VM a little bit more warning than I did. How's that? It'll work for now. Let's see what she does with it. That's probably why she keeps looking up into the trees. <laughs> you can 
hear the gorgeous orange-breasted bush shrike. The wind just starting to blow as a big grey bank builds in the southwest. Probably won't deposit anything for us. Now, King Quad, you're wondering about her teeth and if, if they break, what will happen to her? Um, you know, if the top tooth of the broken one there snapped off, I think she'd be okay. If the other bottom one broke, yeah, she'd be less effective. But, you know, she'll have other methods of killing things. So I, don't, I think she'll be all right. I'm just going to quickly get on the radio again. Go for James. Go ahead. few people getting mobile now and deciding they'd like to come and see Tandi. <laughs> we will try and get another view. Isn't that a lovely view of her tail there? I'm just going to let Rexon find a spot and then we'll move in a bit closer. Mike, where are you? From which side? Okay, I'll just keep coming. Oh, of course, Tom, just make your way straight here. I'll move out when you get here. We've had a nice time with him. So they're going to come here. We won't be able to stay for the rest of the next hour, I don't think. But for now, we'll remain and enjoy the view of Tandy's tail. Now, Eric, you ask a good question. You say, is there a time when a leopard is, say, in heat or about to breed when she's to be avoided, when she'll be irritable. Well, I think she's kind of in that state now. I don't recall her leopards be in heat being any more uh, sort of confiding than they are at other times. But I do know that leopards who are looking after youngsters like she is, of course, can often feel a little bit kind of irritated by things. So, I mean, not avoided, but certainly given space. We can try and move a bit now, I think. Um, what do you think, Vimpi? Shall we go back or forward? Let's try back first, because it'll be the least disturbance. not going to get us a great view. I'm going to do a little bit of a turn around here. Oh, yeah, we'll get a nice view here. How's that, Wimpy? Is that right? lovely early summer afternoons now. Just coming lovely smells. Leopard in the grass. The sound of machine gun fire, which isn't in fact machine guns, but highly excited shutters crashing on a vehicle nearby. Chris, no, she won't. In the same way that, you know, when Joy asked her question about the buffalo, would she kill a buffalo to feed her cubs? She will absolutely not take this back to the den. They don't do that. 
you know what, if the den was three feet from here or, well, I don't know, say 100 metres, 300 feet, you might pick it up and take it there if the cubs were a little bit older. But remember, by the time they're six, they're not going to be living in a den anymore anyway, and or six, six weeks or so. So, no, normally they don't take meat to the cubs, they take the cubs to the meat by the time they're old enough to move with her. There we go. I think we've got quite a nice view actually compared with the view everyone else has got. Shame. I can't see the mother in parlour, but I think she's around here still. Poor thing. Oh, she's just looked up at the other vehicle and uh, now the machine gun fire of the cameras on the other car have begun. While they shoot this leopard, all of them taking many pictures to popularize the world's most beautiful cat, let's head across to Tristan Dix, who has not only found some signal, but also some signal. Well, yes, sort of superb coloration, but for the cloud that's coming up, which is not a bad thing, uh, I would just like to correct myself. Viem said to me, is Tumba really only seven months old? And I said to myself, no, that's absolute rubbish. He was born in July, of course, so he is one year. He's 17 months old, is what I meant. So Tumba, for those of you who don't know, is her previous cub. He's 17 months old now, not seven months. And she's having a good old chew now on that little impala. I'm going to give her another one minute in this position and then I'm going to move around to the other side. And you can see there's no sunlight anymore. It's dipping behind some clouds. Ah, now, Philip, you're saying which animal out here has the largest and smallest circles of fear, and you've defined the circle of fear as the distance uh, within which an animal will react to you, I guess, because, of course, the circle of fight and the circle of flight will be very different. So let's call it the circle at which that they will react to you. That's a really good question. I'm going to say that the smallest one in other words, the animal that you can get closest to without it reacting to you on foot would be out here probably a hyena. I'm thinking carefully here. I'm going to say a hyena as an adult. If a leopard grows up with people. You can get quite close to the cubs and we've been within 10 meters of Shongile and Horsana on foot and they don't react. So that's a pretty small circle of fear. The largest circle of fear, in other words, the anim when an animal will react uh, the greatest distance will be the antelope species. You'll find that they will not let you get within a hundred meters quite often and sometimes even sometimes even more than that. Elephants, remarkably, are quite nervy. They don't let you get very close before they react. In fact, as soon as they see you and perceive you, they will react. If it's sometimes, if you're far enough away, it'll just be to look at you, but they will react. I've walked very close to buffalo bulls before without them moving. I've walked quite far from buffalo bulls with them reacting very adversely. And I remember an experience we had, Brian and Steph and I, last year, when a buffalo phalanx, I mean, there were about six or seven of them, saw us at about, ooh, it's 150 meters or so. They got into a line and they started coming at us. Not running, but walking with purpose. And we had to skedaddle quite quickly. So I think it just depends on the situation. But I think those are the kinds of scenarios, the ones that I've painted for you, that you'd expect. Hi, that's a very good point, Project Alpha. Thank you for that. I didn't think of that. You said you can walk up to a pangolin. Yes, you can. Absolutely, a pangolin won't react to you. Good point. That is a mammal. 
And a puffer, yes. I suppose a, a snake, some snake species. I was more thinking mammals, but yes, fair enough. Keep them coming. Oh, I'd also like to correct myself again. Uh, I mentioned the Greenland shark the other day as the longest living uh, vertebrate organism or the longest living animal in the world. And it was pointed out to me, of course, that that Chinese clam, whose name I think was Ming, actually, was over 500 years old. <laughs> the Chinese clam called Ming. And I think that's the oldest animal. Debbie, you make a good point. You say, where do I think the wild dogs fit on the circle of fear? Mm, they've got a pretty small circle of fear. You're right. Yeah. I think absolutely wild dogs would be a good one. Probably even sm not smaller than a leopard cub, but certainly smaller than a leopard adult. going to see if we can get another view around this way. I'm not sure that we will. We can always go back. Ah, just listening to the radio. Tom is not coming to the sighting because he just found a lioness. How's that, Pumpy? Is that at all good to you? Just watch her behavior again. This is quite a similar position to the one that we first parked in. And to keep my legs inside the car this time, PM reckons that she reacts to that. I'm convinced it's sound. But I'll take VM's advice and we'll see what happens. What we forget quite often, of course, is that our camera ops cameramen spend as much time out here as we do and they learn if they are vaguely interested a massive amount of animal behavior do you hear me paying your compliment there Liam? yeah just in case you missed it people often do it's because it's so rare What a very pleasant way to spend a Tuesday afternoon. My brother is probably just preparing to head home in the traffic. Now, this is Trix 88. You ask a fascinating one about whether or not I think these wild cats recognize voices, individual voices of the guides, or whether they just sort of see the vehicles and hear the sounds of human voices and don't believe there's any real difference. I think they do. I think that they, whether they recognize us as individuals, I'm not sure. Can they hear the difference between different voices? Yes, they can, because I've seen leopards react to loud voices versus soft ones. I can't believe that an animal that has senses as acute as this wouldn't pick up in some way the different intonation of say my voice versus Brent's I mean we couldn't have more different voices and I can't believe that she wouldn't recognize that whether she associates the difference however in our voices with uh, any kind of emotion or any kind of experience I don't know can she tell the difference I've no doubt does she associate them with anything? In other words, does it therefore bring some kind of meaning to her life? I don't know. Elephants, yes, absolutely. Elephants react to different people differently. They tend to uh, recognize people, definitely. Leopards, I don't see why not, but I'm not sure. It's mostly on account of the fact that they're very poor at English. Or Shangan. That's it. Your cat speaks English, does she? Excellent English. That's very good. She's in 
enjoying her food. All right, let us go back to Tristan now. He is watching the water, the hippopotami, and the sun sinking.